Welcome to Namecast. The thing they don't tell you, Kev, when you have a beard... They don't tell you things? No. Shit, I meant to say mustache. Okay, the thing they don't tell you when you have a mustache <laughs> is runny noses are straight up awful. Oh, yeah. Like, it's it's an experience, and it's not good. You ever have, like, the mucus kind of run down your mouth? The mustache makes that worse, because, like, the mustache actually catches it. So, you have mucus run into your mouth when your nose isn't running, because it's just been, like, trapped in the mustache Hello, everybody. Welcome while. to Namecast. Uh, this is our <laughs> weekly podcast we do that's not about mucus and gross. Uh, yeah, we got a great show lined up for you today. We're going to be talking about inside Mm-hmm. Full disclosure, we're not doing spoilers until we get to the part with the spoilers. Yeah, towards the end, we're, we'll, yeah, we'll have to go over we'll the spoiler you know, part. We'll let you know, but we're not going to go over that until we say so. And we got a bunch of other stuff to talk about as well this yeah. week. We're going to be talking about Devolver Digital and what they're doing at E3. We got a new Harvest Moon game. Mm-hmm. Is everything Dark Souls now, Kev? I, I think every game is Dark every Souls Every game is Dark Souls. Destiny yeah. 2 is weird. And beautiful games are built on more than just artists. Yeah. So we got a lot to talk about in our topics, and the game of the week is, of course, Inside. And our game of the week next week is going to be Hollow Knight. It's a big one. It's a big one. We've been playing it for the past two weeks now to try and get ready, and I don't think I can beat it, but I'll try my best. We'll do our best. We'll do our absolute best. So if you want to play along, I would start now, because it's a long game. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, Kev, we got to get into it. We got to get into our housekeeping. You know, what have you been playing? What have you been up to? Um, So recently, yeah, I played of course inside for the show yeah um also been playing a lot of persona five i think a lot even understates how much you've been playing well, i kind of understate it because <laughs> at the end of last weekend i started getting sick yeah and i missed a bunch of time from work and um you know what, what else are you gonna do when you're just home sick yeah of course you're sick. gonna play video games sick you can't <laughs> see the air quotes but they're there <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I went from like five or six hours in Persona to, I think I'm at like 37 or 39 now. Yeah. So that's a good jump. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's a lot of Persona and this game is awesome and I am undoubtedly going to finish it, which is funny because like when I started it, I'm like, um, you know, it's just so long. Like I want to try playing it, but I really don't see myself putting in more than, you know, 12 or so hours right but now that i'm like this far in it's like oh i gotta keep going i gotta keep going there's so many like good characters and good stories and so much stuff um i think either after i finish or when i'm closer to the end i want to do a bigger section about all my thoughts on the game so yeah i'll kind of hold off and sharing too much of it but yeah i'm enjoying the crap out of it yeah you've sunk a lot to and something you say about it when you're playing is you're like you don't realize how much time you're sinking into it yeah definitely (laughs) like it's great too, because like one thing about this game is there's like two kind of distinct sections. One where you're in the real world and doing like high school things and just like yeah. improving your own social skills and stuff like that. Um, and then there's the other section where you're in the dungeon and it's like you know that turn-based RPG type stuff. And both of those things are both fantastically well polished, and you can sink way more time into them than you realize right. by playing through them. Uh, the dungeons especially because at least like when you're in the real world it's broken up by days but dungeons are just kind of continuous and yeah it's it's a time sink of a game and something i noticed whenever you're playing it is like the on the loading screens and everything it says take your time is that just what it's going to say the whole game or yeah i think so okay take your time and would you agree with that statement of take your time because it seems like a lot of things are time based like i got to get this done before this but it is yeah kind of go to lax pace it's I have completed all the time-based things with huge amounts of time remaining. Oh, really? And, like, thing is, like, so whenever you get the dungeon in the game, you have so long to complete them. It's basically what most of that time stuff is. And yeah. you can complete them right away, and then you have all that free time, or you can spend a bunch of free time and then go complete the dungeon. Um, I prefer just to get the dungeon stuff out of the way right away, and that gives me lots of free time in the end. But, yeah, like, yeah, I definitely feel like I could take my time all I want with it and it'd be fine. I don't know what happens when you actually get to that time limit. Right, right. But now, uh, could another method to be to maybe, I don't know, can you grind or something before, like get yourself stronger for the dungeon so you can do the dungeon better? Um, no, not really. You can do a little bit. Um, there's like a randomly generated portion of the world called Mementos, which is like based on their the old personas, like their dungeons were randomly generated. Yeah. Uh, they went for design dungeons for this, but then they added the mementos, which is 
randomly generated things. So you can kind of grind in there if you want. Um, but it kind of feels like doing more dungeons. So I prefer to do the social stuff instead when I'm not in dungeons. All the social stuff. Cool, man. Yeah. Looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. What have you been up to? Um, as far as games, I've just been sinking a lot of time into Hollow Knight, so we'll be talking about that all next week. Yeah. And then I finished Inside, and uh, I haven't really played much. I'll play a little bit of a game called uh, Balls. Balls. Yeah, it's a mobile game from uh, I think Ketchup. It's kind of yeah. fun. They they have like similar games for the most part. It's kind of like Breakout. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eh, not having too much fun, <laughs> with it, but it, it's just okay. Uh, for the most part, I've just been actually doing a lot of running and biking. And running and biking and running and biking. <laughs> and it's exercise. Good. Yeah, yeah. Well, You're doing quite a run soon, right? Yeah, I'm doing my first uh, like half marathon um, next weekend. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Really nice. excited to uh, p- pay money to run. <laughs> yeah, I'm smart. Uh, yeah, no, it's gonna be good, man. Uh, listen, I just want to get into the topics because we got a lot of crap. <laughs> yeah, on, we man. do. <laughs> you were saying Persona. It's it's a very stylish game, a very beautiful game. Yeah, you know now. Something about beautiful games, Kev, is I, I, I notice on the internets, you see people being like, oh, they must have really good artists on this game because it's really nice mm-hmm. looking. You know, this game isn't as nice looking. Must not. But there's so much more than, I don't mean to say just the artists, because obviously the artists are a very important part of the process. Yeah. But it takes a whole team to make a game look beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Well, like, I want to stress for all aspects of a game, everybody working on a game, no matter whether their title is artist yeah. or producer or whatever. They're all game designers. Yep. They're all programmers to some extent, at least and having to know a lot of technical stuff to yeah, do exactly. the work that they're doing. Um, yeah, all artists, all designers, they're all, I don't know, money people. Like, yeah. That you need to know all these things to some extent to uh, work well in video games. And yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of exemplary examples of non artists making games look incredibly beautiful yeah yeah no absolutely so yeah we're gonna go over some of the the tricks and the things and how they do to make games look super noise yeah yeah so So, what do we got kev so i want to go with like one of the kind of the most basic easy to understand ones is uh just general responsiveness of a game um a game is going to look way more fluid, like the higher frame rate it's running at, right? Yeah, that makes so sense. So yep. programmers writing quick code is improving the art yeah. of the game, right? Making it look beautiful and stuff like that. Um, but it also comes like, especially down to like UI stuff. If you click on a button, you expect the button to respond immediately. Right away. Yeah. But think about like, what's a lot of those buttons doing? Maybe you're opening up your friends list. Yeah. Well, shit, that needs to pull that stuff from the server. And right. so what's have all that information before it can even show what the button's supposed to show. So, you know, w- what are you going to do there? Some type of animation or something? Or? So, yeah, that's usually when it plays some sort of transition animation. So it can give itself that, like, half to a full second to, like, actually get that data that it needs to show the thing. Yeah, because I've played some indie games where they don't have that yet. And yeah. they're pulling the information at probably the same amount of time. But it feels longer and jankier because they don't have that nice. Yeah, it just like freezes for a second yeah, exactly. and like and then it pops in and yeah, yeah. That that's why like yeah, there's a lot of work put into transition stuff and yeah, it certainly applies to gameplay stuff as well. Okay. Um, another cool, very technical one that I want to talk about is photogrammetry. Photogrammetry. Do, do you know what this is? I actually don't know what that is. This is when you take pictures of things and build 3D models from them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, one game that made super heavy use of this was uh, Star Wars Battlefront, the new one. Yep. And that's why the game looks so freaking beautiful and so photorealistic is because they did a shit ton of it. Okay. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> it's some insanely complicated maths and a lot of work to take those pictures like well lit and taking the pictures you need and actually getting them to form. So wait, I don't understand. So they're taking a bunch of pictures of an object, almost like they're they're 3D modeling it, kind of, or no? Forming a 3D model from those pictures. From those pictures, and then wrapping the pictures around it, kind of, to give it the right colors and features, or I don't understand. Well, like, so they have to, like, form the base 3D model first. Yep, yep. And then after that, they can use the color details. Okay, yeah, From the pictures to, like, you know, make textures for it, but... You know, it also needs to be smart and figure out, okay, what kind of textures do we need? Because something metallic 
at a very base level in a computer is very, very different than something that's like cloth. Yeah. Just how they're rendered is just very, very different ways. Um, so yeah, it's also, there's a lot of like stuff to figure out how to choose, like how you're going to draw that pixel as well, how the pixel okay. is going to react to light, um, shit like that. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of technical stuff there. And that is something that's actually like really big and on the cutting edge of games yeah. right now. Um, so yeah, I expect to see kind of more and more photogrammetry use. Um, one, one thing to note, actually, it's been really big in VR. And there's a few tools that you can actually do this yourself um, is to take a bu- bunch of pictures of an environment. Mm-hmm. Like uh, one pretty famous one is a there's like a church in England one that Steam uses for uh, or Valve, I should say, uses for some of their HTC stuff. OK. And uh, they yeah, they took a bunch of pictures of this kind of lead way up to this church and yeah, they built a 3D environment out of it, and then you can walk around inside of right, there in your VR right. headset. Yeah. Like, so that's yeah, pretty that's cool. pretty cool. And yeah, I'm sure that'll get used a significant amount more on um, future games. I okay. guess Google Earth kind of uses it to some extent, too, because if you go into a city in Google Earth, you can actually see the heights to the buildings. Yeah. Especially with see the their new faces Earth. and yeah. stuff. Yeah, really yeah. cool. Really cool. So it's that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, to get into more tricks. Um, Tricks and stuff. Tricks and stuff. So, when a person is playing a video game, mm-hmm. generally they kind of expect the what the monitor be showing them is actually kind of more similar to what they would see on a screen when watching a movie. Okay. Yeah, right. I so they you. expect the same kind of artifacts that you get from a camera that's filming a movie. Um, so there's actually a lot of stuff that kind of emulates those artifacts and those are kind of the, some of the cool new effects like a uh, bloom mm. which is a big one that what's, I mentioned what's a all bloom the time. Kev so bloom is when you have a very very bright light to your eyes that light isn't actually coming from just that source but actually from around that source as well because it's so bright right that the uh, yeah the light can actually get bent in different directions to the extent that it's actually noticeable okay yeah um so yeah, it looks like it's kind of glowing. Um, so yeah, it's very much a glowing effect, but it's pretty specific to like bright lights. Um, so yeah, that's that's a really big one that games are using a lot now, and especially indie games with like very simple kind of low poly styles. Yep, they'll use a lot of blue to get uh, bloom. Sorry, to uh, get very kind of like smooth gradients and you know lots of cool contrast. Like especially like if you're peering at like. Uh, light from around a cliff or through trees, stuff like that. Um, so that's super cool. Uh, yeah, there was a dancer game that I was trying to think of that used it. I can't think of the name of it, but anyway, yeah, yeah, it, that used it a lot on the PS4. But yeah, yep, yep. Um, and yeah, moving on from that, like, so that's kind of like a lens artifact. The lens in our eyes does the same thing as camera lenses do. Um, but the games actually also use other lens artifacts. Um, pretty freaking famous one is a. Uh, Freaking uh, lens flares, lens flare the JJ's, <laughs> the JJ the Abrams. Abrams. Yeah, but like you know, that stuff gets added artificially just because yeah. like people expect. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. that's how it should look. Um, but what I actually also think is pretty cool is uh, a lot of games actually use film artifacts. Do they just to make the image look? It looks more natural if it looks like it's yeah. got film artifacts. So like kind of little bits of noise, kind of patterned noise in a way. Things that you're used to seeing. Yeah. When you look at it. Yeah. Yeah, you're kind of used to seeing, and you know the extent that it's used can kind of change how um, how old timey it looks. Right. Like if it's like super obvious grainy film artifacts, and yeah, it looks really old time timey. But if it's kind of really subtle, then the image just kind of looks more live. Um, mm. I actually used a film artifact in my uh, last game jam game. Oh, you did. Yeah, just very kind of subtle, but it kind of because like it most of it took most of the background was actually just space. Like yeah. you feel like there should be a little bit of flicker, a little bit of movement little happening bit of in the background. Yeah. And yeah, just adding a little bit of fill noise in there actually gave me the effect I want it. That's Super funny well. because uh, as far as your game goes, that's the only moving object then would it not be? Cause not, nothing moves in your game. Yeah. Huh? Okay. That's interesting. So like, yeah, it yeah. looks a little more like there's, there's absolutely nothing moving. So it looks a little more alive because right. You know, there's always a little bit of kind of flicker going on. Okay. Um, another effect I used actually is called chromatic aberration. 
You're going to have to explain this one. So this, An aberration's a ghost, right? Ah! Yeah. <laughs> so this one is actually an artifact of older camera lenses. Oh, sorry, okay. Excuse me. Um, but one... Well, so what it is is that depending on the um, wavelength of the light, it gets bent by the lens differently. So what that means is it's picked up in different spots on the film. Which okay. means there's a separation of red colors and green colors and blue colors, right? Um, from the same position. So if you look at the edges of them, there's like the red outline on one side, a green outline on the other side, a blue outline on another side. Right. Yes. 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 Um, so separating those out, um, creating that aberration of colors, is where you get chromatic aberration. Okay. Um, and yeah, that one's actually been super, super popular. Mm. Um. I used it in my game to make the stars in the backgrounds look a little more interesting and brighter. Yep. Um, because instead of just being a like little white dot on this black space, it is now a white dot, but it's like kind of blue towards this pixel, red towards this pixel. Um, and yeah, it just makes it look a heck of a lot more depth. natural. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's also used it's used a lot in conjunction with kind of bloom like bright lights and stuff that um, makes sense yeah. because yeah that kind of accentuates it more um and one one thing that i actually found out just while researching inside a little bit was it's used pretty heavily in the underwater scenes of inside yep um they'll they, they use chromatic aberration pretty much all the time but like whenever whenever it's underwater they use it significantly more just kind of I guess it gives more of that wa- underwater effect. Yeah, and something they said they used a lot was temporal reprojection. Uh, yeah, so temporal anti-aliasing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, one thing that's kind of been easier to do as memory and speed of components have been uh, becoming better yep. in computers is that rather than just using the data for the current frame you're using, you can actually use data from the previous frame mm-hmm. or even older frames like you can hold on yep. to you know previous drawings of the screen and that's been super useful in terms of anti-aliasing because one thing you'll notice a lot when looking at the anti-aliasing game just to be clear anti-aliasing is when you have the edge of something that's kind of on like a diagonal um if you have zero anti-aliasing you can see this kind of staircase effect yeah. where you can see perfect blocks of pixels yeah the pixels edges. Yeah. Um, anti-aliasing kind of blurs those edges a bit so that it kind of looks more like a straight line. Yeah. Um, right. And how that's been done previously is literally just detect edges, blur those edges. Okay. Um, after everything's been drawn or draw everything to a way higher resolution and then shrink it down. Right. Um, which obviously is really expensive because like you need to draw way more detail. It's, only being used to kind of clean up the edges so there's temporal anti-aliasing is saying rather than draw everything to this super high detail why don't we just pretend that the last frame that we drew was half of the detail yeah of that like bigger frame we would draw so it figures out where pixels are or where in the last frame that's like okay so this is kind of half the detail we need for this frame that we're currently drawing let's fill in the other half of the detail right and then we'll get smoother lines yeah from that um so obviously there's a bunch of problems with it like what if the camera's moving a whole bunch like you know how does it find it um and yeah it has a bunch of fancy tricks to kind of calculate it and it's not perfect to some extent but it looks a heck of a lot better and it solves one kind of big issue in that if you are looking at an edge and move the camera just a slight amount, Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have temporal anti-aliasing, basically the maths for that edge is going to change very drastically just from a really slight movement. Okay. So how it anti-aliases the edge is actually going to look way different than it did the previous frame. Right. right. Whereas with temporal aliasing, it's actually using the previous frame to figure out how to make this edge smooth. So it looks more consistent over time and over small movements. 
Okay. Now, uh, as a curiosity, I guess, as we get higher and higher definitions, when is this going to become kind of not you to, you needed anymore? You know what I mean? When we get into 8K and, you know, as we're, we're going to progress, we're eventually going to get there, you know? When are you going to get to the point where it's kind of unnecessary? Um, specifically anti-aliasing, it won't ever be unnecessary until so? we're doing full ray tracing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's so. just part of the process of how it's done. It's like, right. okay, we're going to break things down into triangles. Okay, from those triangles, we're going to break them into little squares. Right. And, you know, that that's where the problem comes from, as opposed to saying, okay, we need to draw this pixel. Let's figure out where all the light came from to feed this one pixel. Yeah. Like, if we could do things that way, then, then we wouldn't need this. Better. But, yeah. yeah, that's incredibly, incredibly intensive. And we're gonna get there eventually, maybe. Eventually, well, it's used yeah. for that's that's how um uh, like Pixar films and stuff like exactly. that is rendered. Yeah, like it's perfect ray casting light, ray casting right? light. Yeah. yeah. Um, and ray casting light. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like simulating a photon essentially is what's going on there, right? Yep. Yeah. Same kind of idea. It's like okay, light's traveling this path. Okay, it bounces off here, figures out all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, now, what else do we have there? Because, you know, as we were talking about, you're saying it's intensive, there, there's expensive. Now, when you're talking about expensive, what do you mean exactly? Because um, you said it in the past before. Yeah, so expensive is basically how much time does it take up for the GPU to actually Right, and I imagine that would be a big this. factor when you're trying to get on a console or something, right? When it's relatively, after a couple years of release, relatively underpowered. Yeah, well, the, to the, the higher performance you're trying to get, the yeah. more more expensive it is. Exactly. Um, VR has an incredibly big problem with this. Yes. They need to hit a very high frame rate. And if you don't, you're going to have a terrible user experience. Yeah. You're going to make people throw up. Yeah. Not right? only that, but like it needs to be consistent, <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of that stuff. So there's a shit ton of tricks to kind of simplify it. Um. And, you know, it's it's kind of funny. A lot of those times, those tricks are actually just, on the surface level, they're just, like, make things look worse. Is like, when you hear of these tricks, is what right. makes you think. is like, wouldn't that just make it work, like, look worse? And one perfect example of that, actually, is Journey and the sand yes. in Journey. Um, so what are they doing there? So what they're doing with the sand in Journey is, of course, they have, like, the big blobs all just kind of shaped out, but, like... You know, they want to make it look like there's, like, light reflecting kind of, like, randomly off little grains of sand. And, yeah. like, there's like this kind of, like, beams of light just where it kind of reflects really well. Which is funny because, like, when you look at a picture of sand dunes, they kind of just look like mud. They do. They really a little do. little wavy mud, right? Yeah. Um, but Journey, like, they made it feel realistic by doing what is not photorealistic at all which yeah. is funny because like you know it's just kind of like how our brains kind of pick up on this as opposed to how it really looks like sand i mean yeah exactly um so one thing they did actually is they added a shit ton of noise into their sand mm. because and it's kind of funny I was, I was reading the little uh presentation uh PowerPoint they did and uh i guess he actually calculated Okay, one pixel of sand right next to the character's feet. How many grains of sand would there be? <laughs> the answer is 400 grains of sand on one pixel. Really? Yeah. Wow. And, you know, when you think about that realistically, okay, there's 400 grains of sand. Um, okay. Sometimes sand will be, you know, a grain of sand will be rotated in the right way to kind of reflect the sun at you. Right. I don't know, one in 200 chance, we'll say. Right. Um, and... You know, then it'll look super bright, but if you have like 400 grains of sand, that's only going to be a couple of them, so it's not going to be that big influence. So yeah. really, each each pixel should just pretty much look the same as every other pixel, just from the randomness averaging out. Right. There's 400 fucking grains of sand yeah, in one exactly. pixel. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's it's not how sand really looks to us no. when we're going through it, and it's not what looks nice on the screen. Because um, to us, like, so... For our eyes, they're super sensitive to light in the peripherals. Okay. Um, and when you're walking through sand, every once in a while, you'll get like this perfect alignment of the sun bouncing off a grain of sand and catching It'll catch you right in, in your eye. peripheral yeah, exactly. vision. Um, and, you know, that'll like stand out to you and it'll be like a little sparkle to the side and, you know, stuff like that. So they're like, okay, how, how do we get that kind of look to it? Um, so, the, yeah, they've just figured out some sort of noise. Be like, okay you know, 
sand kind of off to the distance and stuff like we're we're just going to have it be this super bright blob kind of of sand in that one spot for just just a moment yeah um and <clears throat> what they did is something that you don't normally do is say that you know how we're going to calculate this stuff is based on where or sorry, the randomness for how we calculate this stuff is based off of where the camera's looking. Okay. Because then normally you would get like really big differences just based on really small camera movements. But that actually is perfect for the case of sand where exactly. you know, you're getting these little glints from places. So it's kind of funny. They used a crap ton of like noise and stuff just to try and get it looking right. Um, but one problem they found was that then there was like way too many glints from way too many places so it'd be distracting yeah so what they did actually was just a super hacky kind of thing it's just like this isn't near the player and it isn't near the camera so we're just going to just kind of mask it out we're just gonna just right. shove it away <laughs> we, we don't want that yeah okay <laughs> um you know there, so there's like a radius that you're impacted by and then anything outside of that radius no yeah it's kind of more less of a radius and more kind of like a like triangle a cone or something yeah, yeah okay. cone yeah um but <laughs> yeah it's just kind of kind of funny they're just like yeah we don't want this it doesn't look right and yeah they did did a bunch of hacks just to make it kind of look realistic to the eyes right um and how we imagine the sand looking as opposed to how it actually looks in a photograph that's really peculiar too how some things like how they actually look when we see them are like eh, it doesn't quite look right even though it's how it actually looks yeah we have this mental image of how it should look yeah i think Jern Jern does a fantastic job of that yeah man Cool. So yeah, there's a, definitely a lot of interesting things that can go on into that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> all very technical and mathy, and like, you oh know, yeah, it's done by the programmers as opposed to artists. But you know, I will call out there is the role of technical artist, yep. which is this programmer, kind of really, really, yeah. yeah, really good at making these shaders, making kind of particle effects, making everything look super nice. Okay. So next we got Destiny Two, Kev. You're excited for this, yeah? Uh, yes and no. You're like, the Bungie fan. My feelings are so weird. Why? Well, Bungie isn't Bungie anymore. Bungie but anyway. isn't Bungie. Okay, what do we got? What's what's going on here with this Destiny 2 news? So, Destiny 2, like, I feel like they're doing a fantastic job and a terrible job at the same time. And I'll okay. explain why. Yeah. Um, so, it seems like a lot of what they're saying in regards to Destiny is that they actually kind of learned a lot from Destiny 1. Right. So they kind of want to restart over in Destiny 2. They're making a big kind of impact to the story, so it kicks off from a new point. Yep. Um, they made an excuse for your character to lose all its progression and stuff. I think so that's So you're kind fine. of restarting from ground one, which, yeah, I, see I no agree. with that, yeah. Yeah, mechanically, it's a heck of a lot easier for them. Yeah. It provides, you know, content for players to go through again. Sure, sure maybe kind of sucks to lose your cool gear and stuff but hopefully you'll feel cooler in the end you know what i mean so yeah yeah same kind of thing um another fucking brilliant thing they're doing is they're bringing it to pc because holy fuck it should have been on pc i couldn't believe when i got a pc to play games like i couldn't believe i was like oh i'm gonna play destiny now i couldn't believe it wasn't on there yeah what the fuck yeah this like Activision Blizzard, like what? Like, <laughs> you know what Activision I mean, doesn't have any PC games, yeah. which is kind of part of it. This is published by Activision um, specifically. Call of Duty games aren't on PC. Uh, they sort of are. Sort of. They they've been doing a shittier job of them recently. Oh, okay. Um, Modern Warfare Two, I think, was the last one that people were like, "Yeah, you did a good job." After oh, that, that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, after that, there's always been kind of problems at launch or stuff like that, and it's been. PC versions have been getting less and less love. Kind of that was like back in 2009. Holy crap. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Which is hilarious because Call of Duty 1 and 2 were huge on PC. Yeah, yeah. Huge. Call of Duty 3 to some extent as well. But Okay. Yeah. Huh. That's kind of funny. But so anyway, with Destiny yeah. 2. <laughs> Destiny 2, yeah. It's on PC now, which is great. Yep. And they actually... This is the first time Activision and Blizzard have really worked together on something despite which is being so owned by the same company. Yeah. Um, Destiny 2 will be on the Blizzard Battle launcher, yep. which is great. It's actually not Battle.net anymore. They called it Battle.net in their announcement, though, I know, which is which hilarious, because, so like, <laughs> I think it was less than a month ago that Blizzard's like, okay, Battle.net is done. No more calling anything Battle.net. I'm still going to call it Battle.net. <laughs> I know everybody <laughs> is, because that's how it's known. But, yeah. Yeah, it's really funny. But was that just maybe a case of, like, the left hand not talking to the right on that one? Uh, that's so weird. Possibly. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> so now you seem not too so stoked on it. 
So there, there's some weird things. Okay. One thing I expected them to add a lot more of was content because yep. especially at Destiny 1 release time, they were like, eh, there was so little content. That you basically the did the leveling and a lot of that leveling was kind of repeating the same stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and then there really wasn't that much to do afterwards. That was a big complaint. And excuse me, with Destiny 2, they aren't adding any new classes. Really? So there's no new like type of character try. Um they're adding one new subclass. Sorry, I didn't look into what subclass that is, which is, I don't I know, just weird. there two subclasses being added. Uh, I heard just one. Okay. Either way, like, yeah. I don't know, subclass is just a, yeah. kind of a small change to a yeah. pre-existing class. Like, I don't know. That doesn't excite me that much. But could there be an argument for not adding more classes as to make things not confusing, but maybe redundant or to um, add things for the sake of adding things? Because I don't think that necessarily makes a better game. Content for the sake of content is, well, pointless, right? Do you, do you get what I mean? Sometimes, but this is Destiny. It's a very grindy game where you repeat stuff. Every yeah. little piece of content you add actually has huge value. Okay. Because you're doing every piece of content, like, I don't know. But, like, would adding another character that's kind of an amalgam of two different characters, like, would that be a benefit to the game? Like, I don't... Yeah, like... I, I don't uh, see. Maybe, maybe. I, I guess the hope was for some originality, say, like, right. you know, not really mix two of the other characters, but, you know, create something kind of yeah. new, like a new way to play. That would have been freaking amazing. Uh, apparently, they aren't doing that, which is, I don't know, a little, a little disappointing. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and the biggest one is they're only adding one raid. That's weird to me because, like, from what I hear about everyone, is like the raids are fire. Like, they're lit. Yeah. They're super fun. But, like, why are they only adding just one? It seems like that's the thing everyone liked a lot. I know. Like, I don't know. I assume they'll add them kind of over time as DLC and stuff like that. But, yeah. like, but how quickly are they going to get the next raid out? Because it's going to need to be pretty quick. Yeah. And, like, one thing um, that I, I did hear, though, is that it's improved because there's better... Um, there's better something. There's better matchmaking. And, like, you're not waiting for people as much or anything like that. Yeah. Is that kind of something that's... I don't know. I don't play games like that because I'm not into that very um, much. Matchmaking has actually been a giant complaint Yeah. Um, for Destiny 1. I don't think they've announced any improvements for Destiny 2, at least from what I heard. Okay. Um, but like for Destiny 1, like you had to go to like random third-party websites that like kind of got so groups peculiar. together. Instead of there being some sort of matchmaking thing in yeah. the game. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Destiny 1 was really built around having your whole entire friend group playing and it's like... Yeah. Not everyone has that. I don't know. Yeah. And like, this this comes back to like, why wasn't it on PC? Like, the original on PC because... It would make a lot That's of actually a really popular culture of how to play games Yeah. on PC. Like, of, of course, MMOs, like, they're just big on PC. But even like... You know, stuff like Overwatch. Overwatch is usually played by friend groups playing together. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and Destiny fits into that so well. Like, I, I don't know. It's weird, no man. answers. It's weird. Some of the decisions they're making. But, I don't know, they are making some good decisions too at yep. the same time. I, I think it's probably going to sell well. I think yeah. they learned a lot from their first game. It's not going to come out with kind of a... Not a no story, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. more of a story, and I think they learned a lot from the first game, so, I don't know. Sequels tend to usually be not too bad. Yeah. Learn a lot. Hopefully the story is a lot better. things in the next game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Speaking of games, everything is Dark Souls. We got The Surge, we got Dead Cells, Nier Autonoma. Really? Nier, Nier Automata? That's being compared to Dark Souls? Okay, whatever. Yep. Hollow Knight, of course, because, uh, well, and Neo, and all these other games. It seems like everything's trying to take the Dark Souls formula now. Is yeah. that a fair thing to say? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't like, think that's fair to say, to be honest. A lot of these games are only taking a couple of mechanics from Dark Souls. Yeah. Um, but there's also like this kind of weird comparison. It's like a lot of people are calling any difficult game yeah. as Dark Souls. If it's hard, it's Dark Souls. Yeah. Like, well, I don't think that's true because I hate to tell you, Dark Souls wasn't the first hard fucking game. You know yeah, what I, I mean? Know. Like, Mega <laughs> like, Man existed. Like, the, these games existed. I don't know. It just, there was just this kind of downturn of popular games. Then Dark Souls came out, and it's like, oh, difficult game. Or, I said popular, I meant difficult. Yeah, no, I know. And uh, yeah. Dark Souls came out, and it's like, oh, difficult games are fun, right? Yeah. We remember that now. Um, you know, it's just Dark Souls was just in the correct time period. 
to be a difficult game to stand out for it. I think one thing they did that a lot of people seem to take after, I didn't see much of until Dark Souls did it, was the retrieval system. Yeah. That seems to be like in every game I play now, where it's like <laughs> yeah. any type of currency, like even in Hollow Knight, yep. any type of currency you have, you lose it. And like there's some type of spirit or some type of way where you, or wherever you died, you got to go back and pick it up, yep. basically. And I see that in so many other games now. Now, you were talking to me about this one, The Surge. What is this? What's what's going on with this game? The Surge, it, this is Sci-fi a Dark significantly Souls. closer copy to Dark yeah. Souls. Um, and it just came out like... Yeah, a couple days ago. It's got like the yeah. same health stamina yeah. kind of system. And yeah, it's pretty recent. And yeah, it's basically sci-fi Dark Souls. Um, it kind of feels more like, uh, what was that? Uh, uh, Lords uh, of the Fallen? Lords of the Fallen, yeah. That's yeah. What I was thinking of. It, it feels kind of more like one of those attempts where it's like, I couldn't get let's, into that let's game make your own kind of version yeah. of Dark Souls. Thankfully, this went with a different theme as Lords of the Fallen felt like way more of a rip. Where it's like, oh, oh it was the same. Do medieval fucking, fantasy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, the sci-fi sci-fi thing is pretty cool. Uh, it's got pretty middling reviews. Here's there's a lot of kind of issues with the overall structure of the game. Yeah. And some so now, issues. do you think this is a bad thing that everyone thinks trying to go Dark Souls? Because like the thing about Dark Souls is what makes it special is that like not everything else is like it. It's kind of like in my mind like the Deadpool movie. You yeah. know what I mean? Where it came out and it was totally different from all the superhero movies, and that's only special because it was like nothing else. But when we're getting more movies that like Suicide Squad after yeah. Deadpool came out, they're like, oh, we got to make this funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like they did reshoots and things like that. Well, it's not going to be special anymore if everything else is like it. Yeah. So do you think we're going to reach that saturation point and if that will negatively impact FromSoft or I don't know. What do you think? Um, I don't know. Like for me, like I also feel biased in that I love Dark Souls too, so much that like what makes Dark Souls special to me has right. very, very little to do with its actual mechanics. Right. So, like, I don't know. For me, like, I see people taking those mechanics and, like, yeah, the retrieval system is a way better way to do lives yeah. than, like, oh, you have to collect lives and pick them up, and if you don't, it's game over, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of progress. Yeah, like, there's no game over in this. It's just, like, oh, shit, I just lost all my money. Let's yeah. see if I can get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, like, yeah, that, that just seems like a better, better gameplay. So, yeah, I'm happy to see other games take yeah. that type of stuff. Uh, but like you know, the magic for Dark Souls for me was that kind of world how you how you learn and right. interact with that world, and then it feels like the world doesn't give a shit that you're there. You're just a piece of that world, and you yeah. know you manage to make a big difference in, in the end just through your hardships. And it doesn't hurt that it's really well designed and crafted. Where you're yeah. like, wait, I'm back here. Oh my god, it loops around like that. Yeah. Like that's really cool. You know, yeah, that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, it, it feels magical in that way. And that's some like a, a game can't just borrow that. That requires a shit ton of skill. Yeah, to make that and pull it off in yeah. a good way. Um, so for me, like, I, I dislike this comparison of people saying, "Oh, this is a, this is a Dark Souls." Yeah, like. This is a Dark Souls type game. It's like, no, it's not. Like, you're, you're missing a lot of the magic to Dark Souls, you know, for me, anyways. Okay. You know, just because you're boring a mechanic or two, it doesn't. So, what would you say then? You would just rather them say it's a difficult game or it's. I don't, I don't follow. I, w- I would rather them not say it's Dark Souls. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, Call of is like, oh, he uses the retrieval mechanic. Right. You know, popularized by Dark Souls. It's fine to say that, but don't say that the game is Dark Souls just because it uses retrieval or just because it's difficult. Right. Right. That that, that doesn't make sense to me and I don't know, annoys me to, to some extent. Okay. Yeah. But it's like, it's funny, you know, Epic Name Bro, we mention all the time on here. Yeah. Um, He had a tweet the other day. He's like, if you want to sell me on a game, just say it's not like Dark Souls because I'm sick and tired of people saying it's just like Dark Souls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling the same kind of same opinion. And a lot of the games that I'm enjoying are not like Dark Souls. Stardew Valley, Persona 5. Right. Like, they're very different than Dark Souls in many, many different ways. Like, Yeah, because you can only take so much of that at, yeah. at a certain point. And, like, it, it, it's kind of interesting to me. While Jean... While Dark Souls, I wouldn't say, created its own genre, per se, I would say it's it's almost like back in the 90s, you know, when you got like, oh, it's a Doom clone. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got that until it became its own thing of, oh, it's a first-person shooter. Yeah, it you improved know I mean? a lot of yeah. like different mechanics. And yeah, of course, exactly. it's super influential on games following it. So I think we're having kind of an example of that. Yeah. Because, you know, back in that day, you know, you'd have fucking Chex Quest and you'd have whatever, all these other games of yeah. fucking Doom clones up until... 
I don't know, Halo? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, probably like Half-Life-ish. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. then then it came into its own as its own kind of genre and own kind of thing. So maybe the action RPG will divert into its own beast and hopefully not be compared to Dark Souls eventually. Yeah, eventually. That's Someday. the hope. Now we got a quick one here. Um, Whoa, oh, geez, we're, we're eating up a lot of time, Kev. It's fine. It's going to be got, a long podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Strap in, buckle your buttholes. So we got a new Harvest Moon game. Now, yeah. you've been out of love with the Harvest Moon series for a little while because you feel like it's been mistreated. Yeah, it kind of it lost its magic. It lost and... its magic. Now, this one's being developed by Rising Star Games. Now, they made Magical Melody, which I actually liked. I thought it was good. I enjoyed Magical Melody, too. Yeah. It's a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, and they, they made a bunch of the other ones as well. And they're saying that it's the 20th uh, year anniversary yeah. for it. And they're like, you know what? We're going to do right by the fans. Yeah. Obviously, they're not going to say we're going to fuck you over because mm-hmm. that's not really eh, that's not really something a company wants to say. Yeah. But do you think this is going to be a return to form for the series? You know, do they think I, they've learned from games that are now doing it better, like Stardew? Yeah, I I hope so because one thing they said is they, they kind of want to return to the um, Super Nintendo yeah form of the game, which is really what Stardew Valley was. was I've never very played much expanded the, the SNES version. Have you? Um, I've tried playing it a bit. It's Little, little difficult. I'd say yeah. some of the uh, Game Boy Advance games does kind of a similar thing, just a little bit better. Okay. Uh, like uh, Friends of Mineral Town specifically. Okay. Um, so if you if you want to see what that kind of style of Harvest Moon looks like, yeah, Friends of Mineral Town I'd suggest would be a good recommendation. Um, but yeah, like I don't know, I really enjoy the format of that. So like, yeah, I'm actually really excited <laughs> to to see what they do, despite the fact that I'm kind of had less faith in Harvest Moon. Yeah. Um, since uh, Natsume split with the old developers, right? Yeah, yeah. Which happened? They're, yeah, they're doing uh, Story of Seasons now. Story of Seasons, which is don't, is Story of Seasons any good? It is pretty good. It I, is. Yeah, I have it for my 3ds. I haven't played a huge amount of it. Okay, I, I do prefer Stardew Valley yeah. to it, but like, it also kind of feels like every game they put out of Story of Seasons, it feels like they're kind of learning more and more. Okay. Um. So. Hopefully yeah, they're being pretty quick that. with putting new games out too. That's kind of like a weird kind of format for them. Yeah, to do, they've but been pumping them out. Yeah, I think they have three now. Yeah, it started back in like 2014. Yeah, that's, that's like one a year. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of cool. It makes the game feel alive. And you want to talk about pumping out games? Holy fuck, Devolver Digital coming hot yeah. on the scene. They've been they've been around for a while now, but man, I feel like every weird game that I'm like I'm interested in this Devolver Digital. Boom, they got their name slapped on there. I know. Like they're like, doing so much now. They're they're growing quick. Oh, they're kings of the 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 weird indie scene. Now, if you don't yeah. know, uh, our game we did last week, which you can check out on youtube.com slash blah 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 and uh, <laughs> and iTunes and Google Play and everything like that. Uh, we did Space Plan, yeah. which was also published by Devolver Digital. Yeah. And you know, you, you and I were even on uh, Reddit the other night, and it was a game of uh it was uh oh, was it some Pedro? My friend Pedro. Yeah, my friend Pedro. Yeah, Some exactly. Banana, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and you're like a ninja on a skateboard doing a front flip and shooting guys at the head. We're like, oh, this game looks so cool and weird. We click on it, boom, Devolver Digital. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I feel like everything is Devolver Digital. And the reason why we're talking about them is they're having their own pro- press conference this year at E3. That's cool. That's really cool because you know, aside from that that great reveal in the 2013 E3 with uh, with Sony bringing all the indies out, you know, you don't really yeah. see indies on the main stage. Yeah, but they're having their own conference, so I don't know what what do you think that means for Devolver as a uh, as a publisher? I think it's what it's really showing is the growth of the indie game yeah. industry, and uh, it, it's great to have a publisher kind of more directed towards indie games. Yeah. Um, because you know that's another option for indie game developers to get their funding. Like, you know, the more options there, the better. And you know, there's been a shit ton of growth and yeah, like Unity, Unreal Engine, um, Itch.io. Like, there's so many like big companies doing really helpful things to get indie games kind yeah, of exactly. out, out to cu- customers. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Devolver Digital has definitely been kind of on the leading edge of that. Oh, as far absolutely. as actually getting those games kind of into the Steam store. Yeah. Uh, getting them to be successful on multiple platforms, including phone platforms especially. Uh, calling out Reigns and Downwell. Yep. There's is fantastic examples. Yeah, they're, um, they're definitely leading the, the forefront on a lot of those things. And you even showed me uh, a picture of uh, Downwell. Yeah. A game that you quite enjoy. Uh, 
it looked like the guy just put up like a trailer for his game, and they're like, "Yo, this is sick," and he's like, "Oh." Thanks to Balver Digital. Yeah. They're like, uh, get in contact with us. We want to play this. Yeah, it was and then funny. It like, ended up being published by Devolver Digital. So I saw that as like an example of how important it is to have a really good elevator pitch for your indie game. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this guy just put up his video. Devolver Digital's like, hey, what's this game? How can I play it? Yeah. The guy just did this super quick, short elevator pitch of like, you're falling down a well with gun boots. You have to kill enemies and stuff. And Devolver <laughs> Digital's like, um, email us, <laughs> <laughs> which is literally how it went, which yeah. is, I don't know. It's really cool for a studio like that. Like, but when they're getting bigger like this, I don't think they're going to be that scrappy, you know, little company anymore, you know, that can do things like that. Do you think, do you think the two can coexist when you're having massive E3 conferences? And it's certainly still, weird because normally with yeah. the E3 conferences, we're seeing these publishers and, you know, uh, console developers kind of talking about what they're doing with AAA Studios. Yeah, exactly. And instead, this is Devolver Digital getting up there and it's like, hey. Want to see some weird shit? Yeah. Jake, <laughs> like, Jake Hollins just released his game Space Plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And like, it's it's just going to be kind of the unknowns and the little little guys. So yeah. I don't even know if E3 is the right audience for that. But that being said, everyone lost their fucking minds well, when like, all the indies came out at the Sony conference a couple yeah. weeks back. Right? Well, the, the other thing, too, is the E3 audience is changing. It is it less is. press focused and more audience focused now. Because this is now. the first year where we're having audience like it's it's an open show. Yeah. Yeah. So like it makes even more sense. Yeah, like, like Gamescom. Yeah, yeah to put exactly. indie stuff up on there. So maybe maybe the indies don't belong at just PAX anymore, you know, your Penny Arcade Expo. Yeah. You know, because that that was the indie show for the longest time. But indies are really starting to take over the market more or less. Yeah. You know, if you just play AAA games, good luck. You're going to be playing, what, three games a year, four games a year? That yeah. That really fall into your interests because they're so expensive. They're so big to make and they cost a bunch. <laughs> you know what's funny is like they aren't actually taking over the market. The AAA market isn't decreasing and indie increasing. Both are increasing are a lot at the yeah. same time. Yeah. The game industry is doing super, super well. Yeah. Which is super fun to see. Yeah, it is super well. It's definitely, it sets the bar higher though for anyone who wants to get in, which is cool. Well, like, it's doing super well in the terms of there's more money coming into it to buy games. Yeah. Now, now which do is you actually subscribe great to the theory of the indie apocalypse? The indie apocalypse. Yes. A bubble will burst. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What do you think about this? Because it seems like we're maybe approaching that you know, point. Or I don't. I, I feel like sort of approaching that point, but I think we're also seeing a lot of things that are kind, kind of seeing those problems arise and starting to mitigate right. them. Steam is looking at doing a better job of surfacing you know, smaller publisher or smaller developed team games yep. on their store. Better ways to do that. Um, Itch.io is growing super well. Um, you know, stuff like Devolver Digital being a really good publisher for a lot of indie games. Yeah. Like stuff like that. Like I, I feel like that kind of stuff helps because really it, what my concern was with indie games is the flooding of indie games and them all kind of trying to share the limelight right and they're but, not being too much yeah and, and i totally get where you're coming from because you know when i see that stamp of approval of a company like devolver or so, something like them you know where yeah. I, I i know them for quality i'm like oh i'm actually interested in checking this out now yeah whereas before i may have been like i don't know about you yeah so you there's know? these people coming in and actually kind of filtering yeah which is i don't know this is uh it's demon valve have talked about it a lot it's like doing that's not perfect because you're introducing personal tastes yeah. And, you know, maybe there's a game that's absolutely fantastic. Just the guy who made it isn't the best at pitching. Yeah. But it's fantastic at absolutely everything else yeah, in life. Exactly. Like, yeah, which, you know, definitely can happen. Yeah, you know? that can happen. But I don't know. Generally, I feel like it, it's better for the market. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the idea that competition breeds excellence, right? Yeah. Which is what I think is something we're definitely approaching, and it's cool that we're on the forefront of it because we're a show that focuses specifically on indie games every week. Yeah, yeah. So last week we did Space Plan. This week we'll be doing Inside, and next week, uh, if you want to play it, you know, go ahead, give her a go. It's Hollow Knight. Yeah. Now, Kev, this week, like I said, we played Inside. What do you think about this? Now, we're not going into spoilers yet. We'll let you know when we do. This is made by Playdead Studios. Now, we did a game by them not too long ago. 
Three weeks? Limbo. I think. Yeah, Limbo. Yeah, yeah. So now this is quite a jump from Limbo. Now they're based out of Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah. I don't know anything about the Danes. I know they make great pastries. I listen to a Danish sometimes. metal band called Shh. Raunchy. Oh, they're Danish. Yeah. They yell a lot. They make scary noises. A little bit. All the scary noises. So it was founded <laughs> in 2006 by Art Jensen. And he was actually, as we talked about them last week, he was formerly of IO Interactive. Yeah. Just dropped by Squeenix. <laughs> they <laughs> well, made the Hitman series and everything like that. Yeah. yeah and he's, he did some sketches in 2004, led to the conceptualization of Limbo. Mm-hmm. Now, in January of 2017, they also confirmed that they're working on another game. Surprise, surprise. A game studio is working on a game. I know. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? I figured I'd put it in there anyway. Yeah. And they said that development will be faster than inside because it took six years to develop. It was Holy Limbo crap. was a long time ago. <laughs> oh, no. I meant to say uh, inside. Yeah, no. I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah, oh, exactly. Inside took six years. Limbo was six freaking years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So the music in the game was recorded through a human skull. Did yeah, you know so that? that's kind of. That's weird. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I kind of read it a little bit. This is like gave it this kind of like creepy atmospheric effect. Yeah, and I'm like cool. <laughs> I'm like I'm sure you could have given I mean, that a bunch of ways. I mean, aesthetic for sure. Now, yeah, it's a funny little gimmick, I guess. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And if you don't know what Inside is, we'll just kind of give a little pitch about it. It's very similar to Limbo. It's kind of uh, Marty Sleever from IGN called it Super Limbo when he re- reviewed it, and I think that's a good pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah. Mostly running right, it's a puzzle platformer type thing yeah. with the. Uh, and More 3D story told through the environment. Exactly, story told yeah. through the environment, and a very uh, it's an interesting story. Very interesting story. Yeah. So now uh, it was funded in part by the Danish Film Institute. I just thought that was intriguing. Yeah, and so we actually have similar things in Canada. Yep, and it's pretty pretty popular in kind of countries that don't have giant industries. Is that yeah. they have like a general kind of media group. Mm, in helps, this yeah. case, it's Danish Film Institute. They you know do things beyond films, obviously, but we also have like uh, Canadian media something yeah can you they will uh give you a certain amount of money and then you're required to pay some back yeah and a weird thing about being in canada is that if you make your game french you can get way more money yeah like if you have a french option for your game yep notable so, notable example being fez yeah yeah yep. that's how fez got so much of its money actually which is just i don't know canada what a weird place <laughs> uh so now upon starting development for this game they opted for developing in unity rather than their own engine as they did in limbo yeah. Now, Limbo was made in its own engine, and the reason why they decided to switch that this time is because it's going to decrease workload, less shit for them to do, basically. Mm-hmm. And I guess porting was a fucking nightmare for Limbo because it took so long to come to the PS3. Yeah, that's a real big benefit of like. Having, I mean, Limbo's on everything now, but. Yeah, yeah. Real big benefit of having an engine is generally cross platform. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, to do it on Unity, I mean. We've both done it. It's like, boop. Like, yeah, you just export you something cha- different. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you may have to change some prompts or things like that, but yeah. it's really not that crazy. Now, also, like Limbo, Inside was a very shortly timed exclusive for Microsoft. Literally, it came out mid-June uh, Yeah. on the X-Bone. It was on PlayStation by August. <laughs> yeah, super short time exclusive. That's- I think that's the appropriate length for a timed exclusive. I think so, too. I really hate the longer ones that Sony likes to do. Yeah. And, yeah. Wait, what? When does Sony ever do that? Sony almost never does timed exclusives. You nuts. Is Sony not... I think Sony's the one I'm thinking of. Are you thinking of Tomb Raider? Because that was Microsoft. No. Okay. Definitely not thinking of Tomb Raider. I don't know what you're thinking of then. Usually they just do exclusives. Because they have a, a big party. Yeah. Of, uh, a big house of first party studios. Anyway, it also won a long list of awards, including the Game Award for Best Indie Game. Now, before we get into the the ins and outs, and like, as I feel like as soon as we're going to start really talking about this game, we're going to kind of spoil it. So I'm just going to let you guys know. Spoilers, we're starting in a second. But before we do that, would you recommend this game? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think it's a good game. It's pretty, pretty short. Pretty short. You can finish it in about three and a half hours or so. Yep. I think it has some clever puzzles. Yep. And I think it uh, really brings you into the experience. Now, that's where I'd recommend you stop listening if you haven't played the game and you really want to. But if you're fine with kind of having it not ruined for you, but maybe not being as surprised by some things, keep on listening or come back after you finish the game and join us mm-hmm. right here. And you can keep 
listening and have a good time. Be part of the conversation. Join us in the comments. So now, Kev, holy shit, what a game. Yeah. <laughs> we got the huddle. That's yeah. the mass of people you joined. Yeah, the big thing at the end. Yeah. The big yeah. thing at the cool. end. It's very cool. And even it was an idea since the beginning of the game back in 2010. It took about a third of the team to get it standing <laughs> for many. And they were working on this thing for like five years. Now, it's so cool. The amount of physics that goes on to this yeah. mass of human. So I object. guess like the body parts that come out of the huddle are like procedurally generated. Yeah. Based on like, you know, what it's doing and, and like they all how it's moving and how it's rotated and, and, and yeah. stuff like that. And really yeah, they're weird. all animating at the same time. There's a lot of uh, inverse kinematics is what it's called whenever yep. like uh, your foot like touches the ground perfectly in a video game. Like, yeah. You know, it's figuring out, you know, where to position things and how to animate them so that they position in the correct way. So, yeah, it's a lot of complicated stuff going on in that. Very ball complicated. Of bodies. Yeah, I wrote down in my notes. I was like, this is the weirdest fucking game of Katamari I've ever played in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Which I yeah. think is just an accurate description because up until that point, I didn't think we were going in that direction at all. Yeah. You know, it starts off and I wrote I wrote, even wrote down in my my journal. I'm like, World War II uh, Jewish boy on the run from the Nazis maybe? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of that's the feel it's it gives it, you at yeah. the beginning. Yeah, it's kind of that. It's got those chase scenes, it's got the officers chasing you, it's got the dogs yeah. running you down. You know, you're the boy in the red shirt. So I was taking parallels from Schindler's List, you know, with the yeah. girl in the red dress. Yeah. But uh, it's, yeah, it doesn't take that long to get weird, though. It starts to get weird as soon as you see, like, the well, once pig you get with close, the worm in its ass. Yeah. Once you get close to the farm, there's some dead pigs with some yeah. worms in their bodies. And that's and weird. And then, yeah, there's one with his ass that you kind of walk past and then it, it from behind you. you, like, it gets up and, like, runs yeah. at you and you have to jump over it and eventually get it knocked out and pull the worm out and yeah and then and then takes a turn where you're starting to deal with zombie control yeah like so yeah there's this little like mind control it's that's how you like yeah. jump in and like lets you control yeah, these zombified people yeah that's the best way to describe yeah. them because it seems like i don't know so how, how did you take that did you take that as like they are people who like lost their own minds or did you take them as like they were created bodies right yeah i thought of them as artificial intelligence that yeah. were used to help serve us and they were they were an ends to a means mm -hmm. a means to an end rather so like they were a tool for you to use yeah is what i took from it yeah originally like near the start of the game like i took kind of took them as like kind of zombified people who had like yeah. their bur their own mental capacity zapped out of them but uh it's kind of weird as as you get closer to the end of the game it's kind of more obvious that these are constructed bodies yeah as as you see them in pods being like yeah. created and malformed and yeah and uh well towards the end you just see a massive mass of bodies as scientists are crowded around it yeah you then go to i i assumed you were trying to free the mass mm -hmm. the mass then sucks you up and you become part of the huddle yeah basically is you what they control they've, they've the huddle yeah. yeah which is just again like we said like a big mass of stuff yeah <laughs> it yeah, man. I don't know. It's. I felt like that was a left turn just for the sake of having a left turn. I liked it, but I didn't like it when I was playing it initially. I was like, why'd you do this? So. I get the yeah. idea of control. I get. I, I get what they're going for there, and that like you know who's actually in control. Yeah. That kind of idea, um, but. I it guess kinda... it just didn't didn't tell a story that I was as interested in as I'd hoped I would be. Yeah, fair enough. Did you find like Limbo more interesting? Um, kind of. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I just like story to slap you in the face a little bit more. Well, I, I think this is part of like how how simple the story actually is. Yeah. With Limbo, it's like okay, you're chasing after a girl, save the princess. That's yeah. It, it's your it's sister. Kind of super easy to grasp. And you're entering whereas Limbo. This is kind of like, you know, it tells you nothing. Yeah, it tells you nothing, and like what it's trying to get at is kind of like, you know the kind of theme of people having control over other people. Right. Where that's like far more kind of nebulous than just like chasing after a girl. I thought that was really uh, well exemplified in the scene where you're with the row of people and this camera's watching you. So you have to assimilate. Yeah. So there's like little boxes where you have to join in and you see the action that they perform. So whether it's a jump or turning backwards or what have you, yeah. you then have to follow. And as soon as like they all stop on beat, you kind of get in time with their marching pattern and you have to follow that. That was, 
that was cool because it's like, oh, am I actually in control? Well, not really. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm just following the masses. Am I just one of the drones as well? Yeah. They're the mindless individuals. So I thought that was a really good example of how to do that. Um, you know, what what did you enjoy about the game? I, I think w- one thing that the game did fantastically well and super obviously a very huge improvement over limbo yeah was it's um i, I c- kind of want to say pacing but really what it is is kind of how it guides you into completing puzzles yeah um a lot of times in limbo you could just lost like some puzzles just weren't obvious mm-hmm. whereas like each time i came to a puzzle in inside i'm like okay it's probably like two or three different things I could try out here. Right. And one of them pretty much always completed the puzzle. Like, and I never really got stuck. I got stuck at one point, point actually. Yeah. Uh, where you get the mind control helmet and you have the two guys and yeah. you have to open up the door. I thought you had to get one guy stuck in behind the door and then like rearrange from there. It took me a while to figure it out, actually. I had mm. to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, And then as soon as I saw the uh, solution, I was like, oh, I just wasn't thinking in the right way. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, I thought it was really good for things like that. Something that I like that it did over Limbo as well is, you know, it makes use of its 3D environment. So when there's a yeah. box in front of you, you're not jumping over the box like an idiot. You just yeah. run around the box and then you can grab yeah, it. Yeah, just pull it from the side and jump up and stuff. Yeah, I kind of used that 3D in a pretty pretty clever way. Yeah, which definitely made it um, more realistic as an environment. Now yeah. we were watching a video about it the other night, and he was complaining about um, yeah, by just errant signal. Yep, and he was complaining about not explaining the artifice of it all basically like yeah he's like okay this is a game but is it trying to act like a game well no not really yeah this is yeah another issue i i agree with this issue and what he was saying and limbo suffered it from it as well was the game is very much set up to be a game but looks like it's trying to be natural environment right but all it all just doesn't make sense like i, I will complain about the water again Okay. Limbo had some not <laughs> sensical water that were very obviously just for puzzles. This game, on the other hand, was like the water is just whatever the fuck the game wanted it to be. The water levels make no sense. I know. You'd be like, outside this building that is flooded, like above the top of the building. Like, yeah. you know, the entire building is sank. And then you'll go in through a door of the building and the water level will be like just barely above that door. And it's like, it's how like, did this, what? Do you guys know how water pressure works? Like, <laughs> like that makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Or like the building's so perfectly sealed to that all the air is trapped in there and like that it's super compressed air. <laughs> it's right. Like, what? But I mean, I guess following that end, you know, I, I don't really, I don't really think that complaint holds much weight to it and i i feel that way because you know if you have so many nonsensical things why bother questioning that one for me like i don't know it stands out a lot okay it's kind of like i I think part of it too is because it has physics-based puzzles right so a lot of times when i'm approaching these areas like i'm kind of observing to say see like okay you know what kind of things will, will i'll be able to do in this area and uh, all of that is based on my own kind of understanding of how physics and stuff works. Right. So when the game like blatantly defies that, then like I'm like, okay, so the stuff I was thinking about about having to increase the water level, like, no, like I shouldn't be thinking about right, it that because sense. the game doesn't work in that way. The game works in whatever way it wants for this puzzle. Right. And I, I guess I can understand that to a point. But, you know, when you have things like a massive huddle of bodies... Uh, combined together you have mind control you have fucking mermaids and you get a superpower that you can breathe underwater you know it's it reaches the point of like you know it's like well the superpower one was weird but like that was weird. you know for the other things like okay yeah this is obviously some sort of sci-fi dystopian world like yeah you know i can accept that there's some technology in this world that i don't know but when you have water behaving like water sometimes and not behaving like water other times like what like that stands out to me like because it is so. defying itself within the game i just get a kick out of it when people are like let's say watching star wars or something and you know you have jedis going around using the force you have lightsabers all this but when the death star blows up and it makes a sound people are like that's not how an explosion would sound in space who gives a <laughs> fuck you know yeah. what i mean like you're you're willing to let so many other things go but that one thing can't slide i don't think that's enough to i mean if it detriments the experience for someone i i don't that wouldn't do it for me. Yeah. And I don't think it's enough to like really 
I mean, you can criticize the game, sure, but I don't think it's enough to say, oh, the game is poorly executed because of this. Mm. I wouldn't say that's far enough to go. And with regards to the the uh, the artifice or the fact that it is a game, I mean, I guess maybe that's something that games will improve upon in the future. You know, th- that's something that maybe we'll demand more of. But like at this point, a game's a game, right? Like I don't know. I just <laughs> I just see it as a thing that the game could do better. Right. You know, align itself with my um, uh, as word I'm looking for, but like. Yeah, the things I know coming into the game right. align itself better with that. Especially when, like, obviously there's there's some biases with like you know building a game for the culture that you live in and the culture that you know. But yeah. water works in a universal way, like you know that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, you know, water works it, in a universal like way. And especially should obey. And like I understand the complaint regarding you know why would they have three platforms designed perfectly like this to go over here like that yeah. makes no functional sense. Whereas with something like let's say a key card to get through a door, well that makes logical sense, but yeah. which is more intriguing? Yeah. You know, well I whereas I would imply that like or, or I'd rather just straight out say that, you know, when you have a two D platformer like that or two point five D, whatever we're gonna call it, yeah. um, like that, you know, yeah, the key card approach isn't gonna be very interesting, but the platforming of aligning all the objects together is more interesting. And I don't think they should have or I don't know, I I don't think they should be required to be like, oh, it's a game because we're using these specifically designed things. Like, I don't know how they could get around that. Well, I think it's just inside does a bad job of deciding which side does it want to lie on. Does it want to lie right. on it being a game, such as you know, Braid? Just this yep. is just a fucking game. Like, yeah. Um, or does it want to tell a realistic experience? Yeah. Or does it want to be this kind of so cohesive basically you're world? saying it's trying to have its cake and eat it too? Yeah. Which is just something you can't quite do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can, I can understand that. I don't think it's strong enough to um, not recommend the game to someone. Yeah. I don't know. For me, that's not a game-breaking experience, but I guess I'm not to the point yet where I don't want gaminess from my games. Yeah. No. Like, for <laughs> like, me, it's not game-breaking either. No. It's just like there's this weird thing in this game that stood out to me that could be done better. And right. It's like pretty obviously like it could be done better, but... I don't. I don't know. It's. I, I think it's pretty hard for the style of game that they're going for, where they're telling the narrative through the world, but they need the world to be a puzzle world. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So finding obvious solutions for that, like you know, they could have like that. There's a mad scientist who's made a bunch of crazy traps for you to get through, or you know, yeah. when we were talking about it the other night, I was like, uh, I came up with a fake example. I was like, well, obviously the scientists are trying to test your skill mm-hmm. to see if you're, you know. Uh, strong enough to pilot the huddle so they obviously set forth these challenges of yeah. dogs and ladders and whatever and yeah <laughs> yeah kind of kind of a little bit silly on that side <laughs> yeah but uh yeah like i don't know like it is pretty popular for these type of games to do kind of more like a dreamscape thing yeah you know like i mentioned before braid like this is obviously this some kind of mental journey for the yeah. main character where this is all taking place in and yeah it tells the narrative through the world mm. you know there's those books but you, they can be completely ignored and you still get the story of like yeah oh hey hey, i think i'm saving this girl but actually i'm kind of chasing her and she's running away from me yeah like you still get that story from raid right um that's told through the world despite the whole game being this puzzle world and it does it because it sets it up in a kind of obviously dreamy type this yeah. isn't this isn't very physical whereas inside is super physical yeah it's trying to replicate real life things for the most part. like it's a crumbling decayed city in a dystopian yeah. future of some type or dystopian universe yeah i i can see that point absolutely now um what exactly did you grab or get from the story or the what's what's it trying to drive home here um i'm i'm still not sure because like it's not it doesn't even feel as concrete as limbo did and limbo was super loose and it just kind of ended abruptly and it's like okay i guess i'm with the girl now and i guess i'm gone i don't know my my assumption with limbo was that at the end you died and that you join your sister in you know because limbo is is commonly known as like purgatory right yeah yeah so that your sister is, is on the cusp of death and you are trying to save her and ultimately when you go through that portal my i assumed that you just died and that you join your 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 sister to Whatever the gates of heaven or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's one way to read it, but like it's pretty obvious about setting itself up for the ways to read. Right. As opposed to this game where it's just like 
Okay, you start controlling the huddle and you start escaping, but some of the scientists are helping you escape, but then you end up on this beach and you bathe in the sun and the game fades to black. Yeah, because what's funny, uh, so uh, Aaron Signal, he took from it that, you know, it's this moment of peace and everything. Yeah. But when I got to the end, you know, and they rolled down and they just flopped right there, I was like, fuck, they didn't make it, is is immediately what I thought. Because I was like, I figured they wanted to get on the water to get away, you know what I mean? Like, they're yeah. not too far away from where they were. Where are they trying to get? Are they trying to get here? If yeah, so, where are they even trying to go? And yeah. Like, you know, why, why is this better than where they were? Yeah. Like, obviously, they're not being experimented on anymore, but I don't know. Can they just stay here? They're really not that far. They're just down the hill from the freaking lab. Exactly. Like, I would have preferred it if, if, I mean, it may not have made any sense, but, you know, if you joined other blobs, then it's like, oh, is this where they just come to die? Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, like, or if it was something like that, or you just floated off into sea. But, no, you just sit there, and it zooms out. And, like, I think at the end, you could almost even see the facility you came from, you know, because it zooms out so much. So it's just... Well, what was the point in that? Yeah, no, like, <laughs> yeah, it's way harder to read what what the ending actually meant. It's right. complicated even more because there's a model of the beach you end up on inside the facility. Yeah, yeah, when you with crash a light through. shining the exact same way, so it kind of makes it seem like Sets it was up a that sound Truman stage. show concept, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, so it's I like, did you do this? I don't, I don't know. The know. ending felt like, yeah, less less of payoff than it could have yeah and then there's also an alternative ending to the game where you have to get the uh the side collectibles and then you go up in this room and yeah. you get basically you get to shut off the player that's controlling you is is the mentality behind it right yeah there's so there's controlling you, you can see this guy on a chair yeah uh with one of those head things that control people the wires going everywhere there's a whole bunch of monitors yeah and you basically pull the plug on his system and then you and then He's still there and stuff, but your character is not controlled anymore. Yeah, exactly. And then it fades to black. Yeah. So, you know, I I assume that's trying to be like, you know, do you have control of this situation? Because you're the one controlling this situation, you know, whereas, but we're controlling you because it's it's a very uh, linear experience, right? Yeah. So it's like, who actually commands control over this? Yeah. So I guess it brings into, not question, but to light the concept of game design in general of like, you know, we're making you feel like you have control, but do you really have control over this scenario? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, interesting. Um, I found it intriguing that they decided to use that as their alternative ending that much less players would get. Yeah. Um, because it's it's a more concrete, you can draw more conclusions from that than you can from the original. But I guess the idea of having a super ambiguous ending does set up for better water cooler conversation you know? yeah definitely. it's like what'd you take from that i don't know like like the end of the inception right like was he in there or was he not in there you know what i mean you get people asking those kind of questions at the end whereas you may not get that if you have something as obvious as the alternative ending yeah yeah i don't know like even then i don't even feel like it set up the questions that well okay with either ending like yeah like we mentioned for the blob one but even for like that that player one like it's I don't know. Did you? Is it actually talking about the player controlling the character, or is the character being controlled by this guy? What is this is that guy you're doing? Having influence over? Yeah. Well, like I don't know. Is 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 that that guy at the computer? Is is that you, the player? I assumed so. You know. But <laughs> like, even that's not very concrete because obviously you're you're you're, you're not there. Right, you're not there, but you're the one. And it doesn't do anything to you, like well, honestly, though. like I think it would be like way cooler if you pull the plug and the game closes. I thought that's what happened. No, oh, it fades to black and does, yeah, it's just a regular ending. It doesn't close the application or anything like that. That would be cool. That would be cool, and then it'd be like, <laughs> oh shit, like I turned off the game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that would. Oh, they should have done that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Jonathan Blow style. But I, you know what though, I, I wonder if they would have passed for approval through a lot of things. Um, it's not like the wild wild west when you're fucking a little more Kojima difficult to do on console but. yeah when sony would be like yeah we're just gonna yeah. close the application like hard quit they'd be like uh really <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure well like i don't know <laughs> i could say you could go back to the start screen but this actually doesn't even have a start screen no you it just start right into the game yeah, exactly yeah. yeah as soon as you start moving the game begins and you can't move left try can't yeah. yeah well it's like i don't know 
Well, I, I want to get into the pacing. limbo. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. limbo, but I want to get into the pacing of this game. Okay, what do we got? Because like this is one thing that they improved so much over limbo is just the overall design and like yeah. even from the very beginning, like so your guy comes down off this little cliff or out of a cave, yep. a cliff or something like that. Who fuck knows what he was doing there? But anyways, cave stuff. The left and the bottom of the screen are completely black. Yeah, and there's stuff to the right. So like, I, there's immediately this kind of like desire. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go right, and I can potentially go up. Oh, I can jump. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, like it shows that immediately, and like, that's absolutely fantastic. But uh, from there on, like, the next thing you see is like, you see there's some people in the woods with like a um, trailer truck that they're like closing up the gate of, like just finished packing or something, and like right. they kind of smack it, and it's like I thought that was kind of funny because like. If it's dark out and there's a trailer truck truck that they just finished packing, obviously bad guys. Yeah, like you could just yeah. tell immediately just that's know. bad guys. It's yeah. just like a funny, like really kind of like film trope. I, yeah. I guess that's kind of exists. But um, yeah, it's that. But like you know, that kind of like it's a preview of like the enemies that you're gonna be facing. Yep. And sure enough, like eventually they they're looking for you, and you have to like kind of hide from yeah. from them while they're looking. And then after that, you pass your pass over a road and kind of fire in the background you see there's a guy and a dog yeah and later on you have to run away from a dog yeah exactly um yeah and it's it previews that like some of the enemies have guns before you're even being shot at and that's something it continues time. to do through yeah. the rest of the game where you know if you're looking in the background and it may not be something sometimes in the foreground too yeah and it may not be even something that like your brain registers initially is like oh this is important information but when you see it later you like kind of reach into your memory banks and you're like, I know this is for something. Yeah, this is familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Like it teaches you that without being explicit about it. Like, you know, Mega Man, Mega Man, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't do that. Yeah. It, uh, it, it shows it in the back and foreground. And I'm not saying the level design is perfect on everything. You know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, game design can't be really be perfect. I don't <laughs> yeah. know what that is, but, uh, it, it does a pretty damn good job. Yeah, definitely. Puzzles are tough. Yeah. Um, the puzzles in the game are tough, but puzzles in general to design are difficult because not everyone thinks the same way as you. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> you have to kind of guide them into thinking yeah. certain ways. And it's like, in order to do that, you have to control where they are from the beginning. Like, yeah. what are they thinking going into this? Yeah, and my favorite puzzle in the game, um, even though it's super early on, is the one with the chicks. Yeah. The only time chicks are in the game, which, whatever. Um, but, you know, they follow you around, and then you have to turn this blower on it sucks them up and you just propel their bodies fucking doop, 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 yeah. into this crate that you need yep and you know it, and just it knocks up. over the crate exactly and like it it sets up this idea of when i did it i was like oh i'm not a good person like i'm i'm using anything for my means to wherever i'm trying to get and it turns out i'm trying to control this blob to get into the sunlight you know what i mean it's yeah like, What's my motivation for just doing anything at all costs to get where I want to go? Yeah. Well, it's just, one thing I did find weird about the game is like you're like running into this facility of bad people. Yeah. Which I, I found weird and different because normally you're trying to run away. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it's like, you know, are you going to take them on? You're just a kid. You don't have any, yeah. you know, they have guns and dogs and, and like fucking... Uh, security, security robots. Security robots that'll yeah. fuck you up. You know what I mean? So, uh, what are you trying to do? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, yeah. Anyways, rolling back a little bit to what I was saying earlier yeah. uh, with pacing. Like, the pacing is fucking fantastic because it does these kind of like high intensity moments and, you know, complicated puzzles and it gives you some time to relax. Like, yeah. You'll just run through the woods a little bit or kind of like long hallways where there's obviously nothing in and, you know, mm. everything's kind of peaceful. And, you know, it controls that very well of ramping up to kind of difficulty, intensity, calming down, letting you calm down, and then introducing some new puzzle mechanics. Yep. And, you know, some thinking that you have to do again. Yeah, it does that really nice. Um, one thing that uh, Aaron Signal again, had a complaint about, which I do agree with this to a point, is, you know, it, uh, it teaches mechanics or concepts or how to do something basically through death. Which, yeah. Which, you know, playing Limbo games the same like... Issue. Yeah, exactly. Playing games like Dark Souls and everything, I'm fine with that. That makes sense to me, you know. Can I do this? Boom. Oh, I guess I can't. Should I do it like this? Boom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I can see how that would break the, you know, you'd rather another outcome be provided, right? Yeah. Well, like, I don't know. Dark Souls, like, it also teaches primarily through death, 
but yeah. execution can overcome that. Yeah. And with a puzzle game like this, sure, it's fine for it to teach it primarily through death. And, you know, it's good about having quick reload times. Yeah. Even quicker than Limbo did, which is sweet. Yes. Um, you know, it's fine doing it that way, but there needs to be a way to overcome it without suffering from death and yeah you know for puzzle games usually that's like out thinking the puzzle or trying to like just figure it out visually yeah exactly um that kind of stuff um i feel like limbo is significantly worse for not giving you opportunities to do that sometimes like sometimes it was just experimental whereas this game did it a little like bit better the button thing right yeah like the button which thing we went limbo. back to in that episode yeah. yeah um yeah this game definitely did do it better but like if you trip over that log when you're getting chased by that guy you're going down yeah, you know like, what I mean. Or if you keep running past the RV that you sh- you're supposed to hide behind, you're going down. You're getting shot. Yeah, you know what I mean. And it's like, oh, like that sucks. <laughs> yeah, there's one time like yeah, there's a dog like way back in the background. And it's like, okay, I need to run f- right to the right. I think I can make it in time. Like you just barely don't make it in time. It's like okay, maybe my timing was just off. Yeah. So like you try and do it quicker. Nope. It's like oh, I got to bait the dog into the water, and then exactly I guess the dog's really slow getting out of the water or something. Yeah. And then you run. Yeah. Or there's like yeah. a hallway that the dog has to go around the other side because the dog can't go down a small ledge for some reason. Yeah. Like there's like, it's just weird, some other weird things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Weird kind of things that you can't figure out without doing experimentation which usually leads to death yeah yeah which is fine to a point but yeah yeah i I do get you there totally cool man do you have anything more to say about Um, the game inside well we we almost forgot to mention one of the coolest freaking parts what's that the freaking sonic blasts yes yeah that was cool yeah that was that was pretty pretty (laughs) freaking amazing yeah (laughs) it just I don't know. It sounded sweet too, and like yeah. it leads up to it for so long. You're listening to those blasts in yeah. the distance what for a long while, yeah. yeah. Eventually, you can see some like um, kind of little like grates being like pushed up by the force, and you're yeah. like, "Oh, there's something big going on over there." And then eventually, you see it, and it actually does a good job of showing you like, "Hey, this is super dangerous." Yeah. Before you even oh, have yeah, a chance shit to, just gets tossed, man. Yeah. Yeah, and then cool. you have to hide behind things, and when it gets you, it cuts you open like fucking. Yeah, yeah, it just dices you into pieces. <laughs> yeah, that was a really cool moment. Um, another moment in the game that I actually super liked was, uh, yeah, when you're in the line of people and you have to like conform. Yep. To what those people are doing, and you have to do like the little jumps. Like, I felt like so sneaky there. <laughs> like, that yeah, was me cool. too. Yeah, yeah, it reminded me straight out of uh, Final Fantasy VII actually, when Cloud has to do something similar. Super dorky of me, but that's where it brought me to. <laughs> yeah, no, it was good, man. Cool. Yeah. Anything more? I don't know. I don't think I have any any other moments from the game. I don't think I have any other moments either. I mean, like we said earlier, I would recommend checking it out. It is kind of expensive. It's like twenty bucks. Twenty one ninety nine Canadian right yeah, now. Yeah, but you know, it it's a good experience. Um, I'd recommend picking it up, checking it out, yeah. seeing what's going on there. If that's something you're interested in doing. Now, as you guys know, this podcast posts every single week. Every we do Wednesday. Yeah. Yep, every Wednesday. And, you know, we cover topics from the week and we do a different game every week. Now, next week, we're going to be doing Hollow Knight. So be sure to check that out if you want. Now, we're also mm-hmm. on a bunch of other platforms in addition to YouTube. Kev, we're on the iTunes. iTunes, yeah. We're on the Google Plays. Yeah. And I'm told you can leave comments and reviews on there. And that's really helpful. I don't think you can leave comments, but you can leave reviews oh, on God, iTunes. I don't know that's how good. anything works. Okay, know. whatever. You can this you can new. say things. You can do ratings and, and mm-hmm. all that stuff. So, you know, try and do the things if you like what we're doing here. I think what we're doing here is pretty cool. If you think what we're doing here is cool, tell your friends. Go chuck a rock through an yeah. egg. What? That doesn't Subscribe, make sense. Leave a it's like. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, like, comment, share. Go beat a muffin. Yeah, so <laughs> go have fun with it. Uh, stuff. Yeah, check out Cartridge Club, man. Yeah, we, www. Dot no, I think I missed a W. The, the, w, dot. The, they got the cartridgeclub.org. The, the two W. <laughs> the infamous it's like the w. WWF. <laughs> it's fine, man. It's good. Cool. Join us in our takedown of bonus barrel. I was, I'm doing it again. <laughs> let's, let's, let's beat them up. <laughs> okay, guys. We're taking off. We're heading out. We're going. The long episode. Words breaking down. Bye. That's fine. Bye. <laughs>